Between the years of 1861 and 1865, our country engaged in a war within its own territory, fought on its own soil, resulting in the death of more than 600,000 of its own people. Known as the Civil War, or the Brothers' War, families were literally divided with brothers, husbands, and fathers fighting on opposing sides, the Union or the Confederacy. The reasons for this fighting, as with any other war, were many, including the abolishment of slavery, incompatible economic philosophies entirely based on color and classism, states' rights, and so on. Our program today will allow you to briefly experience that period of our history using some of the actual songs sung by the soldiers and civilians of both the North and the South, as well as a more contemporary look at one of our great presidents. As this country struggles through the greatest democratic experiment in the world's history, we present this program in honor of the great heritage we all share as its citizens. Rose 
has seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the painful lightning of his terrible bolts with sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah.
Abraham Lincoln, lawyer and statesman, 16th President of the United States during the most violent and troubled times in this nation's history, issuer of the Emancipation Proclamation, murdered at age 56, five days after General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox and the end of the war he so hated. A portrait.
Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. That is what I said. That is what I, Abraham Lincoln, said. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. Kentucky, raised in Indiana, and lived in Illinois, and this is what I said, this is what I, Abraham Lincoln, said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. standing erect I was nearly six feet four in my stocking feet and this is what I said I said it is the eternal struggle between two principles right and wrong throughout the world it is the same spirit that says you work and toil and earn bread and I'll eat it no matter what shape it comes whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his nation and live on the fruit of their labor, or one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. I was a quiet man. I was a quiet and melancholy man. But when I spoke of democracy, this is what I said. I said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy and whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy.
May I, Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, be everlasting in the memory of my countrymen. For on the battleground at Gettysburg, this is what I said. I said, as these who gave their lives to fill this last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. afternoon of December 30th, 1862, advance units of the Union Army of the Cumberland and the Confederate Army of the Tennessee clashed at Stones River, a small stream in the rolling hill country a few miles southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. It was too late in the day to launch a major engagement and so the army made camp for the night. The men bivouacked in the same woods within earshot of each other, and exchanges were made between the troops in the darkness, for this was a strange war. They all spoke the same language, they all read the same Bible, and prayed to the same God. Soon campfires were aglow, and men huddled around them for warmth and to prepare the evening meal. After supper, they sought out their resting places for the night. A Union band broke up a cocky little Yankee tune to entertain its men and to rag the rebs a bit. Every Union regiment had a brass band as did most of the Confederate outfits. No sooner had the tune ceased than from out of the darkness on the other side was a rebel response, playing one of their favorite tunes. At its conclusion, a Yankee band on the other side picked up the challenge. And so there took place that night all along that battlefront, a battle of bands, first one side and then the other playing. At midnight, a band struck up a tune that all of the men knew and loved. Its lyric went, May it ever be so humble, there's no place like home. At that moment, a magical and wonderful experience took place. It was as if some heavenly maestro picked up his starry baton and commanded that every band on both sides join in and play the same tune in the same key and the same tempo. And the countryside was filled with music. Then quietly and rising to a crescendo that drowned out the brass bands came the voices of 78,000 men singing that song together. The music ceased, there was silence, and the men slept. Next morning, the battle of seven, day, seven days at Stone River began. It was not a conclusive engagement. And so that night, hostility ceased, and the armies again camped in the same woods. As the soldiers slept, 
a magical electrical presence was transforming the country. What had been argued by the white folks and whispered in the slave shacks was now about to happen. A tall, lanky lawyer out of Illinois occupied the White House, and he proclaimed that as of January 1st, 1863, in all states at rebellion against the government of the United States, every black man, woman, and child was now and forever free. The source of that authority for that grant of freedom came not from the laws of the Congress, nor the rulings of the courts, but the ink of Abraham Lincoln's pen and the faith of the people who beheld him as a great person. And that's the way it was the night after the first day's battle at Stones River, a small stream in the rolling hill country a few miles southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. 